We are now going to read an article called The Deadly Dare. Follow along with me as we learn more about the poison that rough skin newts carry. The Deadly Dare Rough Skin Newt Defenses In 1979, friends dared a 29 year old man in Oregon to swallow a living rough skinned newt. The man didn't realize how poisonous rough skinned newts are. A lethal, fast acting poison called tetrodotoxin, or TTX, oozes from their skin. The man swallowed the newt whole and started feeling weak a few minutes later. He described a numb feeling all over his body. His friends tried to take him to a hospital, but he refused. Just 20 minutes later, the man was dead. Of course, the newt the man swallowed died too. In that particular case, being poisonous didn't help that individual newt survive. If newts have to be eaten in order to defend themselves, being poisonous doesn't sound like a very good defense. How is being poisonous having a high level of TTX poison an adaptive trait for a rough-skinned newt? All right, so I'm seeing here that tetrodotoxin is the name of the poison that oozes from the rough-skinned newt uh, skin, and we are going to be talking about that a lot more in terms of how having this high level of TTX poison is in fact a good defense and an adaptive trait. Why poison is adaptive? One reason TTX is adaptive is that it acts quickly. A predator that tries to eat a poisonous newt may become sick before it's able to kill the newt, allowing the newt to escape. In fact, TTX acts so quickly that sometimes predators die before finishing their meals. Scientists have observed rough-skinned newts crawling out of dead or paralyzed predators. Even more important, predators can, t can smell and taste TTX poison. The main predator of rough-skinned newts is the garter snake. Scientists have found evidence that garter snakes use their senses of smell and test to tell whether a rough-skinned newt is too poisonous to eat. They have even observed garter snakes doing quick taste tests, licking rough-skinned newts before deciding whether to eat them. That's really interesting, and I want to make a note here because I'm having a question about how they observe that. So I'm going to document my question right here. How did scientists observe this? How did they know that the garter snakes were choosing which newts to eat. Scientists have studied whether garter snakes are able to detect TTX poison in newts. Biologists have placed one newt and one garter snake together in a cage to see whether the snake would eat the newt. Oh, okay, so that's how they were testing um, how these garter snakes detect the newt poison. They put a newt and a garter snake in a cage together and then documented um, what happened afterwards. They have tried this test over and over again using different snakes and different newts. Even though the newts are placed directly in front of the snakes, not every newt gets eaten. Biologists are able to consider the cause and effect relationship between high poison levels and survival in newts by examining a population of newts with high variation. The newts in the test range from having no poison to having very, very high levels of TTX in their bodies. Okay, so they were able to have a range of newts with different poison levels and therefore determine the relationship between um, the garter snakes being able to detect the poison um, because they were able to see which newts that the garter snakes could eat or chose to eat, I should say. In these tests, the snakes consistently eat the newts with the lowest levels of TTX and do not eat the newts with the high levels of TTX. So this is part of the evidence that they're, they gathered here. So let's make sure we document that by underlining it in our reading. 
These results are evidence that garter snakes can detect TTX and that they prefer to eat rough skin newts with lower levels of TTX. The more poisonous a rough skin newt is, the less likely it is to be eaten by a garter snake. So, because they had a, a large variation of newts with different poison levels, they could see then how the snakes would react. And they're con they concluded that the more poisonous the rough skewed newt is, the less likely it was to be eaten by a garter snake. So the snakes only ate newts with low levels of TTX and chose not to eat the newts with high levels of TTX. That means high levels of TTX are an adaptive trait in rough skin newts that live near garter snakes. So it seems like they're saying here that high levels of TTX are adaptive because they're allowing the newt to survive more because from the test, they could see the garter snakes would choose not to eat the newts with high levels of TTX. So therefore, it must be adaptive because it allows the newts to survive longer. Oh, on this page here, I see this picture, and I'm wondering what that is. So I am going to read the caption so that I can figure that out. A rough skin newt's poison is a type called tetrodotoxin, or TTX for short. This is a model of a molecule of TTX. Oh, okay, so this helps me understand that TTX is a molecule, so it's definitely very small. And I remember that when scientists have something very small that they cannot see, they tend to make models out of it so they, they, they can visualize it a little bit better. So I can see here now that this is a model of TTX poison that we have been reading about. How adaptive traits spread? If snakes are in its environment, a poisonous newt is less likely to die from being eaten than a newt that isn't poisonous. The newts that don't get eaten have a better chance of living longer, and that's important because it means more chances to reproduce. Organisms have to reproduce in order to pass on their genes, which are the instructions for making protein molecules that determine traits. If they don't reproduce, their traits die with them. Wow, that's really important. I'm going to make a flowchart to help me remember that. So what this is saying here is that organisms survive. And when they are able to do that, because they have this adaptive trait of being poisonous, they're able to survive and then reproduce. And when they reproduce, they're able to pass down their genes to their offspring. Okay, that helps me kind of recognize a little bit more about the relationship between all of these processes. Let's see how this helps us understand how being poisonous in the new population um, became more common. In the new population, more poisonous newts are more likely to survive long enough to reproduce and pass down their genes, and therefore the trait of being poisonous to the next generation. Okay, so these organisms that are surviving are in fact poisonous newts. So these poisonous newts are then able to reproduce and pass on this gene for being highly poisonous to their offspring. As a result, there will be more and more highly poisonous rough skin newts in each generation. This will cause the distribution in the population to change over many generations. Scientists call this process natural selection. Okay, here is the main word of our unit, folks, natural selection. And this in-text definition says it is, in fact, a, dis a change in the distribution of traits in a population over many generations. This process does not only happen in rough skinned newts, it has been observed in populations of different species all over the world. Okay, so this is how um, natural selection ties into everything. The organisms that survive are those that are 
most poisonous and therefore they then reproduce and they are passing down their genes of being highly poisonous to their offspring and then those offspring are now poisonous and then they the ones that are most poisonous will then reproduce and then they pass down their genes to their offspring causing a change in the distribution of poison level over a period of time and that is what we call natural selection so now I'm wondering what other organisms uh, experience natural selection, this change in distribution of traits over generations. Let's find out. Other poisonous organisms. Being poisonous is an adaptive trait for many different organisms, not just rough-skinned newts. There are many poisonous plants, such as deadly nightshade, hemlock, and mint. Wow, mint, not something I would have expected. You might be surprised to see mint on this list since you've probably eaten mint yourself. The poisons in mint are harmless to humans, but deadly to some plant-eating insects. These poisons are what give mint its minty taste and smell. They are warning signals to tell insects to stay away. Like rough skinned newts, poisonous plants are poisonous as defense against being eaten. Plants can't run away from animals that want to eat them, so they have to defend themselves in other ways with adaptive traits like tough bark, sharp thorns, and being poisonous. Wow, I never thought of a plant as having a defense mechanism. Here are a couple of examples on the left. Let's read a little bit more about them. A deadly nightshade, which is here on the left, is an extremely poisonous plant. Eating just a few berries can kill a human. Mint, on the right, I've definitely seen that before, is a harmless to humans but deadly to some insects. Here are some other plants that I kind of recognize from some of my adventures. Acacia thorns, redwood bark, and cactus spines. Cactus spines I definitely knew about, and um, I have definitely experienced how sharp they are before. Besides poison, plants' defenses include sharp thorns and thick bark. So those provide protection for the plants from being eaten, um, sometimes maybe from being eaten by humans. We just finished reading the Deadly Dare article, and let's make sure that we comprehend some of the main important points. Grab your pen or pencil, grab your notebook or piece of paper, whatever you've been taking notes on, and turn and talk to a friend or family member, or jot your responses down on the piece of paper about the following questions. Number one. What is the definition of natural selection? Number two, in the study that scientists conducted where garter snakes were paired with newts in a cage, why did the garter snake sometimes eat the newt but other times did not? And number three, how did more highly poisonous newts end up in the population generation after generation? Why is every generation more poisonous than gen the generation before. Go ahead, grab your pen or pencil, and let's make sure we comprehend some of these important parts of the reading. Let's go ahead and tackle these questions together. Number one, what is the definition of natural selection? Keyword in our unit, right? Grab your pen or pencil. We're going to go over this definition together. Natural selection is the process by which the distribution of traits in a population changes over many generations. So I remember in our context, what we're talking about here is poison level. So the, the change in our population of newts from becoming less poisonous to more poisonous, that is an example of natural selection happening. That process of what is going on there is natural selection because there's a change in the, in the distribution of the trait of poison level. Question number two. In the study that scientists conducted where garter snakes were paired with newts in a cage, why did the garter snake sometimes eat the newt but other times did not? Well, from our reading in the article, it said that garter snakes can detect the poison level of rough-skinned newts by 
smelling, and tasting the TTX poison. And sometimes garter snakes ate the newt because they understood that it was a low enough TTX poison level where they would still be able to survive when they ate the newt. Comparatively, they chose not to eat the newt when they detected the poison level as too high, knowing that they would not be able to survive after eating that particular newt with the high poison level. So that's why um, sometimes they ate the newt and sometimes they didn't. Question number three. How did more highly poisonous newts end up in the population generation after generation? Why is every generation more poisonous than the generation before? Well, we know that having the trait for poison is an adaptive trait and helps the newts to be able to survive longer. And when they survive longer, they're able to reproduce. And in that process of reproduction, they are passing down their genes to their offspring and specifically the gene for having the trait of high poison level. So they're passing down those genes which are providing the instructions for making the protein that carries the trait for having a high poison level. So their offspring then have this trait for high poison level and then that continues back into the cycle those offspring are surviving, they're reproducing, and then passing on their genes for poison level to their offspring as well. So that's how this process goes in terms of uh, poison level being passed down generation to generation and therefore allowing the population to reflect that as well. We're going to see a diagram in the next slide that will help us illustrate this a little bit more concisely.